Hello friends, welcome to Mains Maxima, a dedicated program to maximize your Mains marks. The first question is on India-Nepal relationship and we'll discuss the model answer for this question. The context of the question is, April 2018, the Nepali Prime Minister visited India and what was the reason for the recent visit of the Nepali Prime Minister? In what way this would be resetting of the bilateral relationship between India and Nepal? So that is the question. By choosing New Delhi as his first port of call, the Nepali Prime Minister aimed to subsist the developmental activities carried out in Nepal by India. So the key word is subsist the developmental activities. Now we will see the answer. We will have to focus on two things when you write an answer. One is the structure of the answer that is the form of the answer a proper introduction an impressive introduction will have to be given a very very impressive conclusion will have to be given so form and the content of the answer will have to be taken care of when you write a mains answer the introduction can be like this india has bordered nepal on three sides and it is geostrategically, geopolitically, geoeconomically, culturally an important country for India. So India Nepal relationship is having cultural, geostrategical, and geoeconomical importance. Now you start with why the Prime Minister of Nepal visited India. It is time to remove the mistrust and subsist the developmental activities. Always it is better to use the keywords which you have got in the question. Subsist the developmental activities and to remove the mistrust. Now a small line about why mistrust was there. From 2015 onwards, the relationship between India and Nepal was in the downhill phase because of the constitutional crisis. More than 51% of the Nepali population, including Madeshis, Tarus, Janjadis, they oppose the constitution of Nepal, which was adopted in September 2015. So, India's position on constitutional development in Nepal, and there was a perception in Nepal that India is supporting the economic blockade of the population who are against the new constitution of Nepal. So there is a perception because of this perception that India has imposed economic blockade in Nepal hitting the economy of Nepal very badly the relationship became very strained not only because of this economic blockade per se in general the rise of the leftist politics in Nepal has resulted in the spearheading of anti-Indian rhetoric and the communist party is coming closer to China so there is uh, pro-Chinese and uh, anti-Indian rhetoric spread by the left parties in Nepal. So these are the reasons why there was a mistrust between India and Nepal. After writing the introduction, write why Nepal should respond positively to India. Massive developmental assistance is needed for the new government because the new government will have to fulfill many of the promises. They promise to improve the employment they promise to give infrastructural facilities like roadways, railways, irrigation, agriculture, so on and so forth. So there is a massive developmental assistance needed for Nepal and they wanted India's support. Secondly, Nepal can have transit only through India. Despite of the fact that Nepal and China have signed a transit agreement in 2016. So to have a Trade with the third country, Nepal requires India's support. Requirement of massive fund to implement the federal structure. Nepal cannot expect developmental assistance from China with respect to development of the provincial capitals because China is not willing to accept the federal system in Nepal. China do not want federalism in Nepal because federalism will create too many power centers and this is not wanted by China as a single government in center will be helpful for China to suppress the anti-Chinese unrestors who are actively participating in protest in 
Kathmandu. Then rapprochement with India will also help in stabilizing the politics in Nepal. For example, the two leftist parties are not coming closer despite of they coming into an alliance. They wanted there is also intra-party factions present in UML. So to keep this anti or non-UML government at bay to continue this UML government, they wanted the support of India through which they can get the support of the Madeshis and the Tarai based population who happens to be pro-Indians. Next is they wanted, Nepal wanted to improve production productivity. So they wanted cooperation in agriculture, livestock. Increased connectivity through inland waterway is what is needed because in the recent visit there were three important agreements signed which are path breaking agreements one on agriculture second on inland waterway and third on railway why inland waterway inland waterway is very cheap and we have rivers sharing between india and nepal so a landlocked nepal can access the water inland waterway through which they can get connected to sea Hydroelectric power potential is massively present in Nepal. So more and more they wanted our support to invest in the hydro power sector. Railway connectivity between Raksol and Kathmandu which is planned is poised to counter China's Belt Road Initiative because Nepal has accepted to be a partner of Belt Road Initiative last year and there is a 8 billion dollar Chinese railway connectivity which is planned between China and Nepal. So to counter this we wanted Raksol Kathmandu railway connectivity. By connecting this, Nepal will be able to get connected to one of the mammoth railway line project in world. Say 1.25 lakh kilometer of railway line connectivity can be now accessed by Nepal when this railway connectivity between Raksol and Kathmandu is realized. This is what is the plan Kathmandu to Raksol railway connectivity which is planned by India and Nepal. And just slide will show you what is the plan which China is having with respect to railway connectivity with Nepal. Kerang connectivity, Kerang to Lumbini, Pokhara will be connected by China. It is a 8 billion dollar project and this map is on rivers. Just have a glance of the river system which is shared between India and Nepal. So inland waterway connectivity will be very cheap as well as very fast. Nepal has accepted Chinese invi invitation to enter BRI. So Lhasa will be connected with Kathmandu. Lhasa Kathmandu connectivity through Belt Road Initiative. You have to write conclusion. They wanted massive investment both from India as well as China. So they wanted massive investment and they wanted prosperity as well as development. Prosperity and development they are universal goals and every country has legitimate interest to pursue these two goals. So when they are coming to India to subsist the developmental projects, development should not be seen through the optics of geopolitics. This would be a conclusion. The next question is on the Rohingya crisis, which is very much in the news in the last two years, because a number of Rohingyas are subjected to, are alleged to be subjected to persecution by the Myanmar government. The question is this, Rohingyas are one of the largest stateless population in the world. In this context, discuss the challenges India is facing in the issue. So write about the Rohingya problems and what are the problems which India is facing to rehabilitate or accept the Rohingya refugees and what are the challenges which India may be facing with respect to the Rohingya crisis. This slide is speaking about the political boundary of India and Myanmar. So India and Myanmar, they share more than 1600 kilometer boundary and through Myanmar, Northeast India can get easily connected to the ocean. So it is very critical for the development of Northeast for the look East policy or the act East policy that Myanmar is the gateway for our Northeastern states to get connected to the oceans because they are not having uh, connectivity, sea connectivity, they are starved of the developmental prospects, our northeastern states. These are the states which are sharing the boundary with uh, Myanmar. This slide is speaking about the sharing of the boundary between Myanmar as well as India. And this is the state 
Rakhine uh, state which is the homeland of the Rohingya population. Rohingyas are Muslims. Since 2012, there is a conflict which has emerged between the Rohingya Muslim population and the majority Buddhists. So there was so much of suppression and there was a sense of fear which is looming large in the mind of the Rohingya population as a result of which they are compulsorily moving out of their homeland and they are today becoming a homeless citizen, a stateless citizen. Even United Nations says the Rohingyas are the last man of the international society. So from this Rakhine state, Rohingyas are going to Bangladesh. Lakhs of Rohingyas have gone to Bangladesh, but Bangladesh is not giving citizenship despite of the fact that they are accepting the influx of the Rohingyas. They are not offering them citizenship status. The introduction could be, who are Rohingyas? Rohingyas are Muslim minorities, they are stateless entities and there is a possibility of ethnic cleansing which is feared by the Rohingya community today. Large scale exodus of Rohingya population to different neighboring states or countries of Rohingyas called India, they are going to Bangladesh, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia. Despite of the home of the largest number of Muslim population, Indonesia is not accepting the Rohingyas, Thailand is not accepting, even Malaysia is silent to the Rohingya issues. Only Bangladesh is accepting Rohingyas and that too Bangladesh is not giving citizenship status to the Rohingyas. And the government of India recently decided to deport some 40,000 Rohingyas present in India. And this was subjected to so much of criticism. Why India is planning to deport the Rohingyas? There is a uh, apprehension, there is an apprehension that the Rohingya population present in India may pose some security ramification to India because of an allegation that the, some of the hardcore Rohingyas have so much of uh, alliance with that of the extremists and the terrorists, especially the Islamic State. The northeastern corridor which is already fragile will become more fragile because of the Rohingya infiltration or the Rohingya population. So, further destabilization of our Northeast India could not be tolerated. Even Myanmar government and the Bangladeshi government, they are not accepting Rohingyas as citizens because there is 1982 Burma citizenship law which is denying the citizenship status to Rohingyas. So that is why they have become stateless citizens. India do not want a strained relationship with the neighbors. India is practicing neighborhood first policy. So, the official policy of India will be in match with the official policy of our neighbors. Myanmar, Bangladesh, they are not accepting Rohingyas as citizens. So, we are also not ready to grant citizenship status to Rohingyas. We are exploring multiple possibilities for extending our relationship, multifarious relationship with that of our neighbors. One is to bring prosperity to India, especially our Northeastern India and secondly to keep Chinese at bay because China is trying to intensively win the friends around uh, around India's neighborhood through its string of pearls policy and the recently BRI initiative. Definitely the Rohingya crisis is going to cause a lot of damage to the Kaladan multimodal transit project. This is a long pending project. It has to come into force in 2016 itself. But this project, a critical infrastructural connectivity between India and Myanmar is delayed because of many huddles, especially the bureaucratic huddles. So, this project will further get delayed, which will deprive India, especially our Northeastern India, the possibility of development. And there is also an allegation that the Rohingyas may use fraudulent means to acquire India's citizenship. Through some fraudulent means, they may acquire India's citizenship. And already we have faced this problem. Today, Assam population is consisting of 30 percentage of Muslims. That what is resulting in a sense of regionalism, son of the soil concept against the people who migrated illegally from Bangladesh. And an estimation says that more than one crore of illegal migrants from Bangladesh, they are residing in India. And we do not have a strong, a very stable refugee policy. So, the time is requiring India to formulate a very strong refugee policy, a permanent refugee policy which is not only applicable to Rohingyas, but also any refugee. Now, what is the response to reaction to India's 
decision of deporting the 40,000 Rohingyas. Any deportation will result in violation of some constitutional promises which is available for all persons, not only to Indian citizens. It will violate Article 14 which provides right to equality. It violates Article 21 which provides right to life. Definitely India's stand of deporting the Rohingya refugees will violate some international law. One international law is a principle of non refoulement which means that the refugees should not be compelled to go back to a place where they can be likely persecuted. What are the ways forward can be a conclusion. India is a home of refugee and hospitality. Earlier we have given shelter to many refugees, Parsis, Tibetans, Jews, even the Afghans. So we are a land of refugees. And also India is practicing one important cultural civilizational rule or a norm or a value called as Atiti Devo Bhava. The guest is God for India. India is the largest democracy in the world. It practices pluralism and tolerance. So we should not deport the Rohingyas. Rather we have to rehabilitate the Rohingyas on humanitarian grounds. Everyone not only citizen, everyone has human rights. A right to safety is a human right. So this has to be provided by Indian government today. And there are a number of stateless citizens uh, who are of persons who are persons of Indian origin present in Myanmar. A report says that close to 3 million persons of Indian origin, they are rendered stateless because of the Burmese citizenship law 1982. So India's Myanmar policy is a test case of India's foreign policy. India's Myanmar policy should be characterized by three Ds. One is development, second is democracy and third is diaspora. The next question is on India-Bangladesh relationship. We will read the question first. India has a huge stake in having a friendly regime in Bangladesh for strategic as well as economic reasons discuss. So introduction will have to have some good points about India Bangladesh relationship. India and Bangladesh relationship is embedded in a rich matrix of history, culture, religion, language and kinship. And we are coming closer to each other because we are realizing that if we stand united, we will be able to increase the prosperity, shared prosperity is one of the reason. We know that last year it was Bangladesh which recorded the second highest growth rate in its economy that is 7 percentage economy, the highest growth rate in the world, second highest growth rate in the world. So this speaks about the potential, economic potential which Bangladesh is having for India. And we know that it is having so much of demographic dividend like that of India. So we have so much of sharing of the demographic profile like India, Bangladesh is also having so many youth populations which would become assets for the economic reconstruction and development of both the nations. India requires Bangladesh because we wanted to provide connectivity to Northeast. For example, Kolkata, Dhaka, Agartala bus service. Both countries, Bangladesh and India are victims of terrorism and religious fundamentalism. And we also will have to take note of the fact that there are only two countries in South Asia who did not join the Belt Road Initiative. One is India, another is Bhutan. Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal, they have become already the partners of Belt Road Initiative. So definitely we need to improve connectivity with Bangladesh so that we will be able to utilize the prospects, potentials which Bangladesh is realizing in the recent times. And this is the One Belt, One Road Initiative. So a very mammoth infrastructural connectivity with which China is planning to connect more than 60 countries spanning across continents. So sea connectivity as well as road connectivity is planned and many countries are expressing their willing, willingness to become partners to this BRI. Look at the trade potential and the trade actuals. Bilateral trade is 7.5 billion dollar annually and this is the data on, of 2017. 11 percentage increase compared to 2016. So trade relationship is growing. And we know that the potential is not 7.5 billion dollar, four times more 
than what we have realized today is the trade potential if both India and Bangladesh they come closer economically. Signing of FTA will definitely increase the exports of Bangladesh to India by more than 182 percentage and the transaction cost because of connectivity also will get reduced by 300 percentage. India already has provided duty free access to a number of Bangladeshi products and this will definitely benefit Bangladesh. Bangladeshi products will have free Indian market access. India has already given duty free access for all Bangladeshi products. So, Bangladesh can get connected to Indian market freely. And as we have already said, it is very fundamental, very crucial for developing our northeastern part only through Bangladesh. Bangladesh India connectivity will help in South Asia connectivity and South Asia can connect to Southeast Asia as well as China and this will provide a game changing opportunity to change the economic profile of the region especially the South Asian region. We are members of a number of multilateral forums like Mekang Ganga Cooperation, BIMSTEC, BCIM, Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar, Corridor. So, these are multilateral economic grouping which can immensely improve the economic potentials of India as well as Bangladesh. In order to decongest the Chittagong port, India is providing line of credit to develop the Ishwardi port in Bangladesh. Also with respect to power connectivity, we have invested in the Rampal power plant. Bangladesh is having energy insecurity and India's cooperation with Bangladesh in the energy frontier can help relieve the energy insecurity experienced by Bangladesh today. And we also have gone for Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal motor vehicle agreement in order to get connectivity with our neighbors. And our relation with Bangladesh will be a big push to our activist policy as well as our Make in India campaign. We have also agreed for joint investment in blue economy, especially in the Bay of Bengal for exploration of hydrocarbons, marine ecological preservation, deep sea fishing, preservation of marine ecology as well as disaster management. However, the main problem is non-signing of T-star water record between India and Bangladesh. So, this is one of the main irritation a thorn in the bilateral relationship not signing this is an irritation or a thorn present in bilateral relationship non signing of the T-star water accord. We have seen that when we signed the Ganga water treaty in 1996 extremism started declining. So, signing of water treaty with Bangladesh is not only to resolve the water dispute, but also to resolve the problems posed by insurgency and extremism. Now, what can be the conclusion? We have seen that Bangladesh India relationship is oscillating like a pendulum that it is oscillating between sweet end and the sore end. Sweet end when the Awami League government is in power and sore end when Bangladesh National Party is in power. Irrespective of which political party is in power, India-Bangladesh relationship will have to be very very active. Engagements therefore will have to go beyond the political parties to become genuinely irreversible. And both are seeing today that they are converging around a sense of indispensability. Not because they are affected by terrorism, but because today they have are uh, seeing that there is a huge potential economically for both the countries to transform not just the national economy, but also the regional economics. Thank you.